Jeff Schweinhardt. Jeff has 22 years experience in the turfgrass and landscape industry, working in various parts of the country. He earned his bachelor's degree in turfgrass management and landscape contracting from Virginia Tech and a master's of science in turfgrass science at Michigan State University. He spent five and a half years as a research technician coordinating the Tacoma Pierce County Natural Yard Care Program, conducting outreach and education for homeowners and professionals. From 2013 to 2018, Jeff served as coordinator of the Arboretum's Grassroots Initiative including a 1.3-acre interactive turf grass, turf grass exhibit, website, and ongoing homeowner lawn maintenance workshops. Jeff joined the University of Maryland as a lecturer uh, in the Institute of Applied Agriculture in 2017, teaching courses in landscape and turf grass management. So, welcome. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for being here today. I certainly appreciate it. And we appreciate um, being able to speak about turf grass management uh, for equestrian applications for uh, Logan and I appreciate being here. Uh, we just a little bit about uh, the not association, but the group that uh, we are a part of, of course, I'm University of Maryland, but we're also part of the Equestrian Sports Turf Alliance, which uh, is a, kind of a conglomeration of research researchers across the country. Kind of loose association at this point, but we're trying to see if we can look at more equestrian turf grass research on a national level and certainly focus on that here on the state level uh, as we move forward. So this evening, um, I would like to talk about some of our general turf grass management practices for equestrian facilities. So I'm going to uh, take a look at different grasses that we use for these facilities, and then a lot of the major maintenance practices. And then Logan will follow up with uh, some case study type uh, examples from his experiences at some of the uh, racing tracks here in Maryland. And then we'll kind of open it up to questions at a panel discussion small panel discussion at the end. That said, um, if you have any questions as I go along, uh, feel free to ask those and, and I'll try to address them as I go, or feel free to hold your questions for later at the end, either way, your preference. So when we think about turf grass maintenance practices, we think about um, what we call cultural practices. And within turf grass, we think about five primary cultural practices being mowing, watering, Fertilizing, uh, cultivation, which is aerating and detaching, and then pest management. I've added a sixth one in here, which is variety selection. And so I think the real foundation of a good uh, turf grass management plan is the species and variety selection. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, first thing here. But the point here is that if we can do these first five things well, we're spending less time on pest management. And so uh, within that framework, I want to try to cover uh, some of these practices. When we look at this aspect of turf grass quality, um, we look at several different characteristics. So I help out and uh, I help out with the, with the variety trials at the University of Maryland. We have turf grass variety trials with several different species, uh, as do other universities around the country and we look at these quality components including density, drought tolerance, persistence, pest tolerance, color uniformity, and a big one that's important for equestrian venues is wear tolerance because we have a, an added um, uh, viewpoint of safety with regards to these equestrian athletes that you perhaps don't have in your regular home. You certainly have it in a lot of our rectangle and, and diamond sports, but it's especially important equestrian sports. Um, so if I think, if I ask many people what uh, what they think of the quality, a lot of times when I do homeowner workshops, they'll say tolerant. But I just want to bring this slide up because there's so many aspects of quality that are important. And obviously, wear tolerance and safety is a very important one when we're talking about equestrian venues. 
So we'll talk about the species options and selections, and kind of where do they grow? We'll talk about mowing practices and other cultural practices within this presentation. As far as growing different turf grasses, um, there's three major zones within the U.S. You see here towards the northern tier of the country, we think about this as a cool season zone. Towards the southern tier along the Gulf Coast, all the way over to the southwest, we think about this as a warm season growing zone. And then in between, we have what's called the transition zone. So that's a place where, or a region, I would say, where you can grow a lot of different grasses, but none of them particularly well. So if you think about our warm season grasses, um, think about the high grass, especially from a forage perspective, but also as a utility grass, you think about Bermuda grass, you think about Georgia grass, Sanofi grass, St. Augustine grass, and all of those do great in the Gulf Coast and into South Texas. If you think about our cool season species being tiger blue grass, prairie rye grass, tall fescue uh, being the major ones, and those do great as we get up into the uh, upper tier so here in Maryland, we can grow Georgia grass, we can grow tall fescue, we can grow bluegrass, we can grow ryegrass, we can grow Bermuda grass, but none of these particularly well all the time. So we'll discuss a little bit about why that is. For cool season grasses, we see what's called a bimodal growth curve here. So these are grasses that do particularly well in the 50 to 70, maybe 75 degree range, which we have a lot of that one spring, fall. So as you're coming out of, Vicky, does this have a pointer on it? Or does this have a pointer on it? Oh, yeah. You know what button it is? Um, So, <laughs> so as we're coming out of dormancy from the winter, of course we have the spring flush, temperatures are warming up, air temperatures are going to warm up before soil temperatures go. But you really have the spring flush of growth, um, and you see that a lot of shoot growth is occurring. Now as we get into warmer weather in the summer, hotter weather, for cool season grasses, that hot growth is going to slow down. And we also see the commensurate slowdown in root growth. So roots are still growing. It's just that you're having more roots die in the summer than you are roots growing. And so you have less of a root system during the summertime for cool season grasses. And then as things cool down in, the, in uh, early fall, we see another uh, little mini bump in uh, leaf growth, but certainly quite a bump in root growth. And so when we think about advising our fertility regimes, a lot of our fertility is going to be pointed towards this fall time for cool season grasses. So a couple of our major cool season grasses that we look at are going to be tall fescue. And so we have two major types of tall fescues, and one would be turf type tall fescue. Um, so this would be uh, narrower bladed tall fescues that are typically thought of for homeowner lawns, um, they have a narrower leaf blade uh, that's appealing to a lot of people for their lawn. K31 is a variety that's a forage-based variety that um, has been around for decades and is often used in a field type of a scenario. It's got a wider leaf blade, it's got a little bit more drought tolerance, it's a tougher grass, and if you're looking at uh, pasture grasses, uh, and for fields, K31 is a viable option for that. Um, so tall fescue doesn't have much shade tolerance, a little bit but in sunny areas, um, it does best in. And the other important thing with it is that it's a bunch type grass. So it will grow in bunches. It does not have uh, lateral stems to allow it to kind of form in, in um, uh, more uniform um, uh, spreading capabilities. So with this bunch type grass, once that once that grass area wears out, it's not going to creep in from the sides and recuperate in that manner. And so we need to be thinking about overseeding thin areas to encourage density for this tall fescue grass. 
So uh, when you're establishing an area, um, you don't have time to go into a lot of detail with establishment tonight, but um, it's important to make sure the seating rates are adequate. Typically, we're looking at six to eight pounds per thousand square feet of tall fescue uh, so that we can establish the dead stand because it's not, once it's established, it's not going to creep in uh, and fill in those uh, thinner areas. And of the uh, cool season grasses we have here in Maryland, this offers the best drought tolerance of our cool season choices. Typically, we see germination time with fall fescue uh, in the range of 8 to 12 days. Warmer weather, a little bit quicker germination time. Cooler weather, a little bit longer germination time. The second grass I'd like to talk about is Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass has pretty good well, wear durability, um, moderate. Uh, water requirements, and it has a rhizominous growth habit. So the fact that you can see these rhizomes here, so these are underground lateral stems. The mother plant will put out these rhizomes, and the daughter plants will grow from those rhizomes. So you see with this, it has that spreading capability that tall fescue does not have. So that's an advantage when you're thinking about traffic, uh, or recuper recuperability from traffic. Berries get worn down and thin, having some Kentucky bluegrass in that stand can help it to fill in more effectively with fall fescue, which is a bunch type and it's not going to spread out very quickly. This has a longer establishment time. Some of our newer varieties can germinate in about 10 days, but uh, traditionally, uh, some of our older varieties are in the range of 14 to 21 days. In Kentucky bluegrass, with all its um, um, you know, attributes with regards to the rhizomes and the durability and the recuperative capacity, it is more prone to certain summertime diseases, particularly a disease called summer patch, which is a root disease, which is kind of tricky to, to control. So it also gets leaf spot uh, in the summertime a little bit more than brown than uh, tall fescue will. And so this can be an issue if you have a stand that is a uh, high percentage Bluegrass. So the idea is that you want some Kentucky bluegrass to offer that recuperative capacity, but if you have too much and you have the uh, high disease weather, that could be an issue for that stand. The third one is perennial ryegrass. We don't use this a lot in Maryland. Uh, this is a grass that germinates very quickly on the range of five to eight days uh, during warm weather. Uh, this is a bunch type grass. It does not have very good drought tolerance, so kind of a high water requirement. It does have good wear tolerance, but as a bunch type grass, it doesn't recover very well once it's worn out. Um, so uh, we also see perennial ryegrass, especially susceptible to a lot of foliar fungal pathogens causing disease in an unlevel area. So for the most part, we think about stains that are predominantly tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass. So a couple terms here, uh, we can use a mix, which is a combination of two or more species of so tall fescue bluegrass would be considered a mix, as opposed to the terminology of a blend. A blend is two or more varieties within the same species. So um, kind of a technical uh, distinction there. So the idea of mixing or blending is that you're trying to bring in the good attributes of two different species or two different varieties um, and try to try to kind of maximize those uh, attributes, contributions to that stain uh, within the industry practices. Um, and so um, as mentioned, uh, as with everything, you know, thinking about the maintenance budget uh, is important. As mentioned, too much bluegrass can have a tendency to get a little bit more disease in that stain. So how do you pick the best varieties? Well, uh, University of Maryland does uh, several variety tests as part of the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program. This is a national program actually based on the USDA campus in Beltsville that uh, coordinates with over 40 different universities across the country to conduct tests of different varieties of different species. So the idea being that we look at the major species that we use in the US but the fact is that many varieties will have regional adaptation. 
What works in California may not work here in the Mid Atlantic. What works down south may not work in Minnesota. And so having this network of researchers within the NTAP uh, program is important. At the University of Maryland, we coordinate with the Virginia Tech researchers to have a what we call the Maryland and Virginia list. And so um, obviously a lot of the research we do at College Park is very pertinent to the northern counties of Virginia. And, uh, and so uh, we've determined that we want to try to combine lists and be on the same page with Maryland and Virginia. So every year we meet with our Virginia counterparts and take a look at the data from the previous year uh, with regards to quality ratings of these grasses and update that Maryland Virginia list. So these are the varieties of tall fescue, bluegrass, ryegrass, Bermuda grass, and Georgia grass that have performed uh, well both here in Maryland and in Blacksburg, Virginia. And so uh, typically we have this meeting in June and that publication is updated by the end of July or early August. This year was, I think we released it a few weeks ago at the beginning of August, but this is located on the Maryland Turf Grass Council webpage. And you can find this under the publications tab of the Maryland Turf Grass Council page. It's publication 237. So within that, we see a list of different uh, different species, different cultivars of the different species. So with this, we've got a food and turf type tall fescue cultivars. These are varieties that have been evaluated for three years or more and are evaluated in an ongoing manner. And then you've also got a promising list there, cultivars that have shown early promise, uh, that have established well and shown early quality, uh, early good quality, uh, but we like to look at that for at least three years before we put that one proven cultivar list. So these are all varieties that have been again tested, looked at. So we provide this for both professionals, homeowners, everybody and, uh, with regards to citizen right here in Maryland, Virginia, to be able to select these cultivars um, as you're establishing areas or as you're overseeing areas. If you've got an existing stand, obviously it may there be you know, there's a certain cost of renovating that, but if you can incorporate the better varieties over time through um, some rejuvenation practices that I'll talk about a little bit later, then eventually you get these uh, better cultivars <coughs> worked into that blend. So for overseeding, um, this uh, provides it done on a consistent basis. It's a consistent rejuvenation for better density, and again, a way to be able to incorporate these improved varieties to help repair damage um, and improve density. So uh, you can do that with a, a, you know, with a mechanical machine like this. This happens to be a, an overseeder here. So you've got uh, a machine that creates grooves in the, uh, in the turf, in the soil, and then drops down seed and rolls it. So that's one way of overseeding. Obviously, it's a little bit easier to do on a shorter cut turf uh, a little bit tougher to do in a mowing time, like oftentimes equestrian venues are. So when we think about mowing, uh, we think about kind of how the grass grows. And so the grass grows, uh, this should not be new news to you all as equestrian people, but to the average homeowners, it's a little bit of a light bulb moment to them. The grass grows from the bottom up. So the growing point is near the soil surface and it's called the ground. And that's why it rejuvenates after mowing or historically after animals eat on that grass. So as opposed to the trees, which have their growing point at an apical higher up uh, growing point, the grass growing point crown is gonna be at the bottom of the plant. So we think about um, usually for um, sports turf or for lawns or for golf courses, we think about different grasses and different heights. Uh, with regards to Equestrian safety, a lot of times we're looking at trying to, trying to grow that grass as high as we reasonably can for the functionality of that turf uh, to kind of increase the health of that grass and then increase the durability of that turf. Uh, so uh, with regards to this, in full season grasses, we're trying to mow a little bit higher height in the summer. Remember that graphic with the bimodal growth curve, we're looking at more summer stress on full season grasses. 
the higher that grass grows, the deeper the roots will be over time. It's not going to happen overnight, but over time. Now, again, my caveat with all that is that we want to mow at a height that's functional for your intended use as well. And we want to mow at the, the highest height uh, to still have that functionality. So we see that the taller turf is going to, in general, provide more cushion for hoof impact. Uh, it's also going to provide more wear resistance for that stain. And so what we're looking at trying to mow at four or five inches for a, uh, for a typical racetrack, training facility, uh, those types of venues. Um, Becky and I were talking about polo a little bit earlier, just before the uh, seminar here. And obviously with polo, we've got fall roll considerations. So you'll be mowing lower in a polo type of a situation, but you know, where we've got a 2000 foot athlete on that surface, we want to try to have as much leaf tissue available as possible. That said, I know that your lawnmower or your, your tractor is only going to mow so high. So uh, just keep in mind that the higher you can mow for that functionality, the better the health of the grass will be. And so this is a, a pictorial description from a kind of classic turf grass textbook illustrating this point with the taller grass there on the right will have a deeper root zone over time whereas a shorter grass there on the left will have a shorter root zone over time so we want to try to think about what are we doing culturally with that the way that we manage things to uh, promote that good root growth and certainly for cool season grasses that's what we're really concerned about um, from a from a health of the grass standpoint in the summertime when we uh, have a little bit more stress on those cool season grasses. I'm happy to give everybody this as a, as a PDF. I know this is a lot of information. This is a screenshot actually from the Master Gardener State Handbook. And so uh, this is more geared towards lawns per se, but it does give a good overview of some of the general characteristics of our different turf grass species here in the So you think about a turf type called best and really good, excellent, I should say excellent drought tolerance. So they can take blue grass, good drought tolerance, or your eye grass, like I said, very poor drought tolerance. Uh, all of these full season grasses do best in full sun uh, and only have fair to poor shade tolerance. And we see with the blue bluegrass, very excellent. Traffic tolerance, good traffic tolerance for tall pesky ryegrass. And then, um, as mentioned, ryegrass, we don't recommend using a lot of that um, for insect and disease resistance. Uh, the other thing I'll mention too is that some of these turf type um, grasses have endophytes in them. And so, endophytes I know can be toxic from a, a livestock, a frustrating uh, type of a nutrient. So, Some of them do have those end bites, which are great for keeping insects away, uh, service feeding insects away, but um, not so great for livestock. Uh, question. Um, so we talked a little bit about, we're going to transition and talk a little bit about fertility here. So remember our full season grass bimodal growth curve. Um, and for warm season grasses, I think for the most part, we don't have this as much for our frustrated facility, but just as a contrast, warm season grasses will grow the most during the summertime, it will go into full dormancy during the winter, start to come out of that dormancy in spring, and then in summer, really thrive in temperatures in the 80s and low 90s, and then uh, start to go into a slower growth pattern in the fall before we go into full dormancy. So to kind of contrast that with our cool season uh, pattern here uh, that really appreciates those mild weather temperatures of the spring and fall. So as we talk about fertilization, our goal is to develop a sound program based on uh, the species and the intended use. And really the program should be based on needs of the plant and the soil type. So I'm going to give a few kind of general recommendations with regards to fertility, but really, you know, every site's a little bit different. You might have a soil that's a little bit heavier and holds nutrients better. 
you might have a soil that's sandier, so that it wouldn't hold nutrients quite as well. So based upon those site characteristics, you've got to uh, kind of um, dial in your, your fertility program. First thing to think about is soil testing. So it's uh, the recommendation is the soil test at least every three years for nutrient needs. Um, and this soil testing will show the levels of major and minor nutrients as well as the pH of the soil and the organic matter content. And so the test will typically provide nutrient and lime recommendations. So how do you go about doing a soil test? You would go uh, choose areas that are similar. So if you have dissimilar areas, you would consider submitting separate soil tests for those dissimilar areas. And you would go in a randomized pattern here, as illustrated on the lab, uh, to 10 to 12 different sites. Uh, take a shovel, plastic bucket there, um, and take uh, soil samples done at least four inches. Of course, you're going to try to either fill that area in with other soil um, as you go, so you don't have a, a, a divot that remains there. So you take these subsamples, put those in the bucket, and then you're mixing that up to a sample about a bulk sample about that big as you send it to the soil lab. So University of Maryland used to have a soil testing lab. They have not had one for years, unfortunately. I know University of Delaware has one. Uh, there's also Waypoint Labs in, in Virginia. There's other testing labs in the region that do a really good job. And usually the soil test is only in the range of $15 to $20. So it's, it's money well spent to know what type of nutrient levels you have there, what type of pH, and what type of uh, organic matter content you have in that soil. And as mentioned, a lot of these soil testing facilities will provide recommendations based upon the results. The one thing, uh, one thing I, I would say about soil testing, though, is that it's not a good indicator for nitrogen needs. If we think about the nitrogen cycle in the soil, it's very changeable. Uh, so nitrogen's being mineralized and being, um, it's being taken up by microbes and released by microbes on a pretty rapid basis during the growing season. So uh, while we, we can test for nitrogen, that's not the tough part, but that number is gonna change a lot as we go through the growing season. So uh, it's better to, to not rely on a soil test for nitrogen needs. I'll talk a little bit about nitrogen recommendations in the next few slides. And then we think about pH. So pH is a, um, is a, is a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration within the soil. And we find that a lot of our key nutrients are most available in the pH range from about 5.7 to about 6.6, 6.7. So uh, you hear people talk about pH a lot, and the main reason is because, again, those nutrients are gonna be best available in that certain pH range. So if you think about the fact that if you're too low, you typically have a lime recommendation so that that soil can be brought up to that pH range. Um, if you're too high, you're trying to do things to try to acidify that soil. But typically here in Maryland, we find soils that are in an acid range. So the scale is from zero to 14 and seven is neutral pH. So the less than seven would be an acidic soil, greater than seven would be an alkaline soil. So we think about what do the numbers on the fertilizer bag mean? And this is where audience participation comes in. What do the numbers on the bag mean? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, yes. So N, P, and K as we go through there. So nitrogen for top growth, phosphorus for root growth, and potassium for overall stress tolerance. If you look um, at a lot of our fertilizers, with starter fertilizers, they often have more phosphorus in them because we know that that's important for root growth, especially with young seedlings. If you look at our winterizer fertilizers, you see uh, a potassium level it's usually equal or maybe a little bit more to the nitrogen level. And so this provides kind of an all around stress tolerance that's important as the grass is going into winter time. Secondary elements we might find in a fertilizer bag include things like sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. 
And then our micronutrients include iron, manganese, sodium, nickel, cobalt, this whole host of different micronutrients. Iron probably being the most important of these micronutrients. So um, looking at um, kind of adapting some of the recommendations from lawn fertilization, um, we have uh, quickly released uh, products that are water soluble uh, that are going to release very quickly and then become available quickly to the turf grass. And we have products that are more water insoluble or slow release. So if we can find products that are a mix of those and provide for um, for lawns, I usually recommend at least 50% slow release. Then we find that that nutrient is going to be able to feed over a longer period of time for that lawn area. Um, now, that the exact mix of water and soluble and soluble that you're going to look for may depend on how much traffic you have on that grass. If you have a lot of equestrian traffic on that grass, you might be looking for something that's a little bit more water soluble. It's going to have a quicker release, but you go out there with smaller amounts more often to kind of feed that grass and encourage that recuperability. If you've got a moderate or a light uh, traffic situation on that, then a slower release water insoluble product uh, would be a better way to go because that product would again release over the course of five, seven, eight weeks, depending upon the uh, composition of that particular product. Um, you should avoid high phosphorus fertilizers if the soil test indicates that phosphorus is adequate. Um, I think the, the regulations are a little. Um, little looser since you know, equestrian venues are considered ag or sports turf um, rather than lawns. Um, so, but it's a good it's a good recommendation to try to avoid high phosphorus fertilizers unless your soil test indicates that that um, phosphorus is deficient. Um, can't always do this, but if you're able to water in this fertilizer, time it for rain. Um, so we kind of move it off the leaf blade into the soil. That's helpful. You just don't want to, don't want to put the fertilizer down before a heavy rain. Um, and then uh, certainly in a uh, community type area, sweeping fertilizer off hard surfaces is important as we're looking for that fertilizer to get on the grass and not into the, um, you know, not on hard, hard surfaces. So when we think about how much uh, tall fescue we're looking at two to three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. This equates to 87 to 130 pounds of N per acre. For Kentucky bluegrass, a little bit more. These are uh, grasses that need a little bit more fertility. So we're looking at three to four pounds or somewhere in the range of 130 to 175 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And we're trying to emphasize ball fertilization. So uh, I've got a, another graph here right after this. It talks about this. Yes, yeah, so, uh, for, so for our cool season grasses, we're looking at you know, 0 0.9 pounds comes from the fertilizer regulations uh, from the state. So, uh, but the 0 0.9 pounds per thousand square feet um, in May and early June, if you do two applications in the spring and then certainly September and October. So for tall fescue, you're usually looking at this one application in the spring, timed after that flush of growth. So if you fertilize well in the fall, you have that flush of growth coming into April and first part of May. So I would time that fertilizer application after that flush of growth, which is usually late May, early June, before it becomes really hot. So I know that we can have some hot early Junes or hot late Junes. But we can also have some more mild early June. So you're trying to time that spring application uh, towards towards the end of spring, uh, but before we really have the onset of summer weather and summer temperatures. Then we're looking at an application in both September and October, or this could be October and early November. So we're again trying to emphasize fall fertilization with these cool seasons. Grasses. Um, I had another fertilization slide there, but if you slightly out of order. Um, 
Let me talk a little bit about how we figure out 0.9 pounds there. So, um, I apologize, I don't have a slide for this, but say, okay, 0.9 pounds, but how do we figure that out? So, again, we look at the numbers on the fertilizer bag. So, let's say we had a 1006. That 10 as the first number means that we have 10% nitrogen in that particular product. So, with that, with regards to that, we would have uh, we could divide 10 by 0 0.9. If we divide 10 by 0 0.9, we, that equals 9. So at 9 pounds of nit 9 pounds of product would be equal to 0 0.9 pounds of nitrogen if we take 9 times 0 0.1 or 10%. So we would be looking at putting at 9 pounds of product on that thousand square feet, and then depending on how many thousand square feet we have, of course. 43.56 thousand square feet of an acre, you would then calculate how much fertilizer you would need for that particular area. So irrigation, um, uh, you know, I know some people may have some irrigation capability, others may not have irrigation capability. Um, typically here in Maryland, even if we go through a bit of a drought, that grass is going to recuperate in the fall with cooler temperatures and hopefully with rainfall during those cooler temperatures. But if you do have irrigation um, and you're in a situation to irrigate, we're looking at uh, trying to achieve one inch of water per week during the summertime. Um, we're trying to water deeply without creating puddles or runoff. So when you're watering, we're trying to get that inch on in, in two or three different days over the, over the week, as opposed to a little bit each day. Um, on shorter cut turf, we're looking at foot thinning in kind of a gray blue color um, as watering indicators as, as the need for, for water as an indicator. So I want to talk a little bit about cultivation practices. Um, and this is uh, very important as we want to be able to try to work in oxygen and air into that soil um, and, and provide a good footing for the athlete. So with airifying, we're looking to be able to increase that air exchange within the soil. So we know that over time, with traffic, that soil will be more compacted. The soil particles will be pushed closer together. So if the soil particles are pushed closer together, that leaves less room for air. And so air is very important, very important within the soil because it sustains our needed aerobic microbes and bacteria that help that soil system to thrive and for the plants to grow well. So uh, with that air fine, uh, this is a process of, of poking holes in that soil with an air fryer so that you have an increase in that air exchange uh, with the soil. Air fine can also reduce thatch. Again, we're trying to stimulate that microbial activity by introducing the ability for air to get further into the soil. So if you're promoting more aerobic microbes, you're trying to reduce that, that thatch. This is the intermingled layer of stems and roots that grow below the green part of the grass and before the uh, soil itself. So air fine is gonna be able to soften the surface uh, allow for better hoof penetration into that soil, and then also it allows for increased water infiltration rates over time. Another term that you could use with this would be coring. So we, it's air buying where you're taking out pores. So it's just a little bit different terminology. And again, you're trying to uh, relieve that compaction, allow for the infiltration of water and nutrients, and increase those oxygen. Typically, what we want to think about this is during our primary windows of opportunity. So if you think about this correlating to the bimodal growth curve of cool season grasses, our best windows of opportunity would be spring and fall because that grass, this process beats the grass up a bit, but if you want it to be able to recover, and you're going to have the best opportunity to recover in the spring and in the fall time for cool season grasses. So uh, thanks to my colleague Logan here for a couple of pictures, but this is uh, air fine crossovers of Pimlico. So these crossover sites receive a lot of traffic um, with uh, traffic going uh, across the infield. Um, and so they, uh, it was particularly important to 
get uh, get verifying on these crossovers um, to ensure a good uh, air penetration into the, into the soil. Um, so for dethatching, uh, I would say that uh, this is kind of a secondary uh, cultivation practice, um, also called verticutting. And what this does is that it physically removes the thatch. So if you think about what is the thatch layer, again, it's this intermingled layer of stems and roots that naturally grows between the verdure or the green part of the moss and the soil itself. And so Kentucky bluegrass, which has rhizomes, is more prone to create thatch than tall fescue, which does not have rhizomes or lateral or um, stolons. So um, basically with the breakdown of those rhizomes, that's what kind of creates the thatch. Now, if you have a fair amount of traffic, that thatch will be reduced. If you don't have much traffic, that thatch will accumulate over time. So if you've got a predominantly Kentucky bluegrass stand with not a lot of traffic, you're gonna have that thatch accumulate over time. And if that thatch gets above a certain level, it's going to start to repel water if it gets dry, nutrients aren't able to, when you fertilize, nutrients aren't able to get into the soil as effectively. Water isn't able to get into the uh, soil as effectively. And also there's a lot of um, disease pathogens that are kind of harbored within excessive thatch. So we want some thatch because this uh, helps to contribute to the softness under, under hoof. But uh, if it's too much thatch, then we can run into plant health problems with the grass. Typically, we're looking at that cutoff line being about a half an inch or maybe three fifths of an inch thatch. Start getting too much thatch, again, we're running into issues with um, water infiltration. If that thatch dries out, it might become somewhat hydrophobic and, and not let water into that system. Um, so we, we run into some issues with too much thatch. So um, again, this is probably not a big issue unless you're looking at a predominantly bluegrass stand. Um, another picture from, is this Pamlico or Laurel? Uh, Pamlico. So uh, tractor mounted for the cutting unit. And what you can see here is from a little bit of a distance. Basically, you're going through and you're pulling out the stash mechanically, and then, and then that would be um, removed or mowed. So, do you guys remove that or, or mow it back in? Okay. So, uh, the point is that if you're getting into the surface, removing it would be optimal. Um, otherwise, you're going to break it up with a mower that's going to be helpful too. Um, and then with top dressing, uh, and kind of a, a practice that kind of an advanced practice here, but uh, can create a firmer, stable surface. So this involves taking sand and then spreading that over that area, particularly after top dressing. Um, this is particularly good to provide an uh, environment for new seed uh, that can be protected from the elements in, in Germany. Um, but the main thing here with uh, top dressing is to stay consistent with that top dressing material. So when you start changing top dressing materials, you can get into layering where the water goes down a little bit and it hits a layer and it stays there. It goes down a little bit and it hits a layer and it stays there. So you have a lot of water on the surface, which is not good. So if you have a top dressing program, you want to stick with the same material um, throughout that program. How am I doing on time? Um, so here we are, we've gone through and airified and uh, just an example of a, of a top dressing on, on the sports turf uh, situation. What are they not yeah. dressing with? This is sand. Or what the, the sand. equipment? That's sand. So so on a high-end sports field that's pretty common, we'll go through and they will airify, pull those cores up, remove those cores, and then they'll put more sand down. Because for a high-end sports field, that medium that the grass is growing on is sand-based. Um, and they do that for drainage uh, so that they can you know, not have a lot of water on the surface for the grass. 
So the other thing we can think about with that is what's called deep time airification. So if you think about airification, if you end up going to the same layer every time, say three or four inches, you can get to where a, a pan kind of develops, a soil pan develops. And so that's not good because the water will move down and then hit that soil pan and then stay there. So varying the depth of airification over time is going to be helpful. And so there are different length times that you can uh, use on an air fire. This happens to be a deep time airification machine that looks like about 10 or 12 inch times there. And so varying that airification periodically is going to be helpful to deter the development of that soil pan layer. Um, just, a, just a couple more slides here to wrap up and, and yield time uh, for Logan's presentation. I could, I could talk for a whole course about integrated pest management and, and aspects of that. Um, but I'll just talk briefly what is involved with Pest management because we've looked at our major cultural practices here between mowing, fertilizing, and then uh, watering, and then aerating and detaching. Again, if we're able to do that and have better improved varieties, hopefully we have less uh, pests to deal with. But the core of integrated pest management is built on a foundation of cultural practices. So, again, these are the five things that I just talked about. Uh, very briefly, and then we think about moving up this IPM pyramid, physical and mechanical controls, um, biological controls, within insect control, we have more biological controls than we do for, for uh, turf grass diseases, uh, and then thinking about uh, chem uh, traditional chemistries as our kind of our last resort. Um, so we definitely want to build our management on this cultural practices and where possible try to engage with a uh, physical and biological control uh, mechanisms and that's part of integrated pest management as we're trying to integrate all of these techniques for uh, management of pests. So uh, a couple examples of this would be uh, in looking at our host tolerance and resistance with our improved varieties a lot of times we have better tolerance to diseases. A good example of this would be looking at our 12 fescue varieties in the NTEP test. We don't do a lot of ratings just looking at brown patch, but we do know that if it's a top performer in Maryland, it probably has pretty good brown patch tolerance. Brown patch is a major disease of tall fescue during the summertime um, in hot and humid weather. And so we're able to kind of elucidate these varieties that have better brown patch uh, resistance, not 100% resistance, but better tolerance and resistance through these trial programs. We talked about cultural controls, doing things that really try to advocate for plant health care and, and growing healthy plants is going to be a core aspect of integrated pest management. Uh, being able to um, Wash the mower after use would be an example of sanitation. Um, a couple of good reasons to wash the mower after use. Uh, mechanically, it's going to work better over time. Um, it's, going to, it's going to be more efficient in the way that it runs, more efficient in the way that it clips. Um, so, uh, biological controls, example, would be nematodes. The nematodes available for drug control. And then, um, obviously, looking at chemical controls. So Part of our integrated pest management, kind of our, our last resort there uh, within a, a true IPM program. A couple uh, resources I wanted to share here. This is a great publication organized by Purdue Extension. Um, Turf grass weed control, a lot of great photos in here and guidelines for weed control and turf grass situation. And then the Maryland Turf Grass Council website. So within this website, there's uh, uh, quite a list of different Maryland Extension publications and resources uh, that are available for uh, anybody. So with that, I'd like to kind of wrap up. Um, it was Selden Becky when I first got here. Uh, 
certainly there are whole courses on the subjects that I just spoke about. I teach a whole course on diseases of turf grass and uh, insects of turf grass and ornamentals, two separate courses. And so we've got several courses just on turf grass management within our program. So to boil it down to 45 minutes is uh, <coughs> not easy, but uh, hopefully you have some of the basics of what we look for for turf grass management. Can I ask a couple of questions? Yes. So, um, is it possible to use to seed with cool grass and warm grass in Maryland so that you have, you know, warm season coming up and cool season grasses are going down? So, that's a great Now, the question was can you seed with cool season grasses and warm season grasses at the same time so that you're able to? take advantage of the different attributes of those grasses. So warm season grasses, there are varieties that have seed, but many of our warm season grasses are planted vegetatively. So they'll, they'll, uh, we'll take sprigs, the sections of those, and then uh, chop those up and then spread those out and then they'll grow together because the warm season grasses have both rhizomes uh, below ground runners and stolen which are above ground runners. That said, uh, there are situations where we have zoysia grass already established, and you could go in and then interseed fall fescue into that. So zoysia is a warm season. Zoysia is a warm season grass. And so zoysia grass is, is wonderful in the summer. It's well, it goes dormant, it doesn't die. So the leaves die, but the plant itself doesn't die. So uh, there's been research on this years ago in this area. Um, and I've been looking at some of these papers recently because at the University of Maryland, we're actually going to start a study in a few weeks looking at interceding tall fescue into zoysia grass and, and to look at what the best establishment method is for that with the hope of maintaining a dual grass system over time and, and taking advantage of the attributes, uh, the good attributes of both of those grasses. So you would recommend spraying with the warm season grass first and then over planting under seeding with the cool season Yes, so, so we can't, so there, so there are, like I said, there are seeded varieties of zoysia grass but because it's a warm seed, grass needs to be seeded in the spring. So the difficult thing about seeding in the spring is that it's difficult to keep it damp enough for it to germinate. Plus, you have a lot more weed pressure in April and May than you do in the fall. So for the typical person, seeding joy the grass is very difficult. But wouldn't you spring it instead? When you, so the question was, can you sprig zoysia grass instead? Yes, that's, so that's more economical to do that. You can sprig that during the summertime and it will, will grow together. Obviously, the earlier in the summer you can do that, the more time it will have to grow together before it goes into that winter dormancy. So we think about the fact that it's really going to slow down in growth once we start getting into lows in the 40s, below 50. Um, and then once we hit that first honest frost, usually late October, it's going to go into that winter dormancy at that point, and you're you're not going to have any more growth until the following April. So it doesn't look good, but it's going to still be perfect. Oh, that's still the grass. And you got to get water that's yes. You have yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you've got to keep the spring stamp because they don't have any roots yeah. until they. But if you spring in the spring. You spring in the spring. Then um, by the fall, you shouldn't have to water. It should be established by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question, because I think there are some readers here. What's the story on the Kentucky 31 fescue and abortion over the years? Uh, has it improved the strain or what? Could you repeat the question? So the Kentucky 31? Kentucky 31 yes. fescue. Yep. Was not the thing, it was the thing to plan at one time, then it's the sound of uh, be dangerous for blueberries, and they were reporting that they were developed just yep. the strength of the W31. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's 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 right. It's right. That's so that's the, so the endophyte would be that the cause of that. So what if it didn't have so the endophyte, we wouldn't recommend that. 
You fight and you fight free. And you fight free. That's the key. So, so the, again, just getting back to what I've mentioned, endophytes from a lawn perspective are beneficial because they in, uh, impart tolerance to surface feeding insects. But in that situation, you don't want the endophyte. You want endophyte 3 K31. Uh, I think the University of Kentucky has published articles of their at programs that they are now they're finding better varieties than the endophyte 3. Right. But have some endophytes, but then endophytes are not detrimental to cause abortion for breeding frogs. Because obviously in Kentucky, that's very important. It's a huge issue. They're getting a better grass stand from healthier grass, but these more varieties can have some endophytes, but they are endophytes that do not cause abortion. Okay, thank you for that insight. So, so yes, this so is the University of Kentucky is working on it. Yes. Yes. I have one more question, and then I'll shut up for anybody else to talk. I think it's important for people to know uh, pasture cutting height. Uh, there's always a question of how high to cut your grass. And nobody knows. Some people cut it much too short, much too for long. Zo for and a zoysia. I think you covered that pretty well, maybe. Yeah, so for, so for a zoysia pasture? Pasture. Yeah. 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 So it's it's gonna as as tall as you can if you've got if you've got traffic on it, it's gonna be as tall as your lower can tolerate for the functionality of that space. So if your mower can go up to four inches, four to five inches. Four to five inches. If it can go up to that, uh, you know, Logan, you look at what you all have done at, at the tracks, right? I mean you're right around five-ish. For those well, racing surfaces. One of the keys when it goes to pasture management is that proper grazing rotation. So it might not necessarily be just the height, it's the rotation of the animals. If it's, if it's 10 inches tall and you got six horses and a quarter of an acre, it doesn't matter if it's the height, right? So that's where the pasture management really comes into play. Uh, for, you know, equine racing surfaces or stuff of that nature, the window is kind of five inches and that's what I'll talk about and that's more of a mower administration than anything for cool season grass I'll talk about that. Let's do one more question and then we'll see what others are going to say. Okay. So, one more question is, have you heard anything about the lobby that Fraser Cage out in this area is from you know, they're collecting the uh, rubber. So that's it's not a lot, it's some byproduct of fracking, I believe. Okay. But so the question was uh, a byproduct, the not line that brings up the pH. Brings up the pH. Um, I am not familiar with such a product, Jamie or Logan. Have you heard of? I'm not familiar with that. Right, that that has other issues yeah. associated with it. This is how they're paying you put it down. What's the name of it? You said it. I don't know. They were paying you to put it down. That right there was paying. Not that at all. It's a waste product. Yeah, it's a waste product. Yeah, it's too low light. Most likely to buy a solid product. Right. So thank you. Thanks everybody.